Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. It was 20 years ago that I heard for the first time of Alfred Dublin. I had just read Ulysses, so that naturally led me to Berlin Alexanderplatz. And I was like, let's go to my Encyclopedia Britannica and look up the author to see what it says. And I have the book here with me. This book is as, almost as old as I am. There was one little passage that caught my attention, and this is it. In his novel, Berge, Mera und Giganten, he unfolds with merciless satire an apocalyptic vision of man's future, in which nature revenges itself on man for having, through science, so radically invaded its domain. I was like, I just need to read this novel. Unfortunately, back then, it was not available in Spanish or in English. Now, last year, and it's been almost almost 100 years since the publication of this novel in the original version. Finally, an English translation of it appeared, and this is it right here. You can imagine, after such a long wait, how happy, how exultant, really, I was to finally be able to read this book. I have read it, I loved it, and I want to share my impressions on it with you. First of all, let's look a little bit at the life and work of Alfred Dublin. He was a physician by profession, and as an author, I have to say he is one of the most versatile, even protean authors that I have ever encountered. Just consider the settings of his different novels. He has The Three Leaps of One Lung, which is set in China. Manas is set in India. Then he has the novel Wallenstein, which is set in 17th century Germany, so, of course, closer to home for him. But then he also has an Amazon trilogy, so you have South America right there. Then Berlin Alexanderplatz is, of course, set in 20th century Berlin. Then Tales of a Long Night is set in England. And finally, you could say, and this wouldn't be a joke, that Mountains, Oceans, Giants is set on planet Earth. There's a little bit more to come about that. So this author is literally all over the place, as you can see. Now, here's an interesting thing that many people do not know. It turns out that Jorge Luis Borges wrote two pieces about Alfred Dublin, which is really not surprising when you think about it, because Borges pretty much wrote about everything. I mean, when it comes to literature, it's almost like if Borges didn't write about it, it doesn't exist, right? So yes, he wrote two short pieces, one biographical piece and then one literary review of one of the Amazon trilogy novels by Dublin. And uh, they are compiled here in Textos Cautivos, which is a collection of the texts that he published for the El Hogar magazine. And it says here between 1936 and 1939. Most of these are available in English. The ones on Dublin, unfortunately, are not. But that's not a problem for you because you have me and I can share with you uh, some ideas that Borges, um, you know, um, relates in his uh, pieces on Dublin. And I want to spend just a couple of seconds here. This is something that Borges says Dublin declared in 1928. And this is Dublin speaking. He said, personality is nothing but a vain limitation. Okay? Personality is nothing but a vain limitation. And he added this, he said that if his novels were to survive, he hoped that posterity would attribute them to four different authors. So we come back to that idea. This is a very versatile author. He likes to present something different with every single book that he publishes. This goes against the very concept of the author. So it's incredibly interesting to me. And because, you know, most authors you read because you kind of have an idea what to expect. Not that they repeat themselves all the time. Some authors do, others don't. But Dublin is an author that you read precisely because you do not know what to expect. And I think that is fascinating. So let's start talking a little bit about mountains, oceans, giants. And I would like to touch upon some general characteristics first. The subtitle of this novel, which you can see in the, in the cover here, is a novel of the 27th century. And I would describe Mountains, Oceans, Giants as a future history of humankind. Borges makes the connection with H.G. Wells, with Olaf Stapledon, and then Chris Godwin, the translator of the novel, adds the names of Aldous Huxley, 
uh, Yevgeny Samyatin with the novel We, you know, and he also adds a novel that I have not read, but I, that I will make a point of reading as soon as possible, which is E. M. Forster's The Machine Stops. Has anybody read this? I have not even heard of it, so I will definitely look it up uh, soon. The novel Mountains, Oceans, Giants begins in medias res, in a time of unrest, war, uh, uprisings, so very, very troubled time. And one thing that you will notice as you start reading is that you will not find a character that fits our concept of what we would call a protagonist. And this is really apt when it comes to the subject matter here because we have a future history of mankind and just as in history you do not get protagonists really you you just have characters that enter and exit the scene as time passes and some of these characters um, are tremendously influential that is the way history is usually written in the novel you will see that there are some characters that emerge towards the second half of the text characters like Devlin which is the actually I'm sorry that's not the name of a character the name of a character is Delville he is the closest thing to a villain and you can see the name Delville devil it's you know that connection right there but characters like Delville characters like uh, Chiron like Tenkir those will appear and um, they will remain in the novel until the end but they do not necessarily become what we would call protagonists so it is written the novel in the way that history is usually written and as i was looking at this i was wondering why do we have this obsession as readers and maybe as authors too with the central figure like why do we have to have a protagonist you know maybe it's a reflection of our ego because the way it is it tends to be at least it's that you know we all see ourselves as the protagonists of our life and people around us as secondary characters right but then all those secondary characters see themselves as, as protagonists and we become secondary characters in their story but i mean look at all the wonderful great novels that just do not have a central figure as i was reading this novel the first one that came to my mind was the waves by virginia wolf but there are so many others faulkner's the wild palms uh, v by pinchon the Kingdom of This World by Alejo Carpentier. And then if you move closer to our time, you have Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting and The Wonderful Flights by Olga Tokarczuk, which I read last year, I think. All of these novels, they do not have protagonists and they are just amazing. They are refreshing too, because we are so used to reading about protagonists and central figures. So in a sense, I would say that Mountains, Oceans, Giants in a way, it, it is true to say that it does not have a protagonist, but I would say it has two protagonists. In the first half of the novel, the protagonist is humankind, and in the second half, I would say it is nature. So, this is a general view of the future, mountains, oceans, giants. And if you ask me, okay, Jorge, describe for me this novel in one word, I would say mountains, oceans, giants is exorbitant. This is a novel that simply refuses to stay in orbit. It is free-floating. It is like a, like a rogue planet. That's how I would describe it. But at the same time, it is not a messy text. It is not a text that is just, you know, all over the place. In a way it is, but it is not messy. And like all great science fiction, this novel chronicles not only a series of events, but also the development of ideas that responds to the historical events and circumstances that are described. He even, uh, Dublin even describes future theories. And there's one example here that I wanted to mention, which is the theory of wind and water. And this theory says that we should do away with the concept of individualism, that we should favor a more collective mentality because that is how wind and water that's how nature works and nature manages to survive so in order to survive maybe that would be a good you know strategy for us to have and this is a future theory that the novel describes the author also understands the importance of inventions and how they shape history more closer to to home you can think about the internet such a simple thing as the internet and how it has completely altered our lives and given shape to our lives for good and for ill right 
So the same thing happens here in the novel, and in this case, the most important invention that is described is a radioactive tourmaline web. Okay, and this is a source of energy that is created in the story that the novel relates, and it has just you know devastating results for mankind. Also, like all great science fiction, Mountains, Oceans, Giants covers all aspects of the human experience in the future. Economics, religion, technology, etc. You name it, it's covered in the novel. So it's not just a description of events. And when it comes to this, you can think of the future visions of so many other authors like George Orwell, Frank Herbert with Dune. I was reminded of that because Dune, as you know, is a novel that has many different layers, right? There's religion, there's economics, there's everything right there. Mountains, Oceans, Giants does the same thing. And also authors like Ray Bradbury with the Martian Chronicles specifically, Kurt Vonnegut, J.G. Ballard, Margaret Atwood, and films like, even films uh, like Robocop and Akira, which also give you not only a history of the future, but also the psychology that goes with it. So this is a complete vision that we have right here. And there are many details also that are provided. For instance, in the future that Dublin describes, food is synthetic, and people have become so used to it that they are just disgusted by quote-unquote real food. Um, this reminded me of that movie Soylent Green, which is based on a novel, Make Room, Make Room. So you have this synthetic food. Uh, the family has become an obsolete concept in this future that is described for us. Then women gather in sororities and they are actually a threat to men. So it's almost the opposite of The Handmaid's Tale. And um, also similar, I thought of this novel by Angela Carter. The Passion of New Eve from 1977, that is definitely a text that you should check out if you're interested in this uh, type of novel. And regarding health, people in the future described in Mountains, Oceans, Giants, they resort to shamans and to witch doctors because the real doctors, if you will, are only for the wealthy and the powerful. And speaking of power, this is a novel that really shows an understanding of power, just like Dune does. So I was reminded of Dune in that sense. You will realize that I have not said anything about plot. Okay, Is there a plot to mountains, oceans, giants? I said before this is an exorbitant novel. Okay, So it's out of orbit. And what it presents is a series of stories that illustrate a zeitgeist. So you do have this concept of the future. It's a full concept. I don't know if I would speak specifically, if I would use the term plot. I don't think that applies here. This is, as I said before, a history of humanity interspersed with episodes about influential people, about the people who give shape to that human history of the future. And the author also understands how history eventually becomes fable and myth, and not only that, but also our need for fable and myth. It's kind of like, you know, we need both aspects of time. History is not only Kronos, but it is also Kairos for us. That is a, a very human thing to do, to have not only the history, the chronological history, but also to find meaning in it beyond, you know, the literal sense of it and the literal sense of the passing of time. In many points in the novel, I felt like Dublin was almost like a biblical prophet, right? And I kept thinking about the crucial role that the Bible plays in Berlin Alexanderplatz. And incidentally, Dublin, I'm sure, knew his Bible very well, and the, the books uh, show that. He was the son of assimilated Jews, and he became a Catholic in the early 40s, actually, when he was living here in the U.S., in Los Angeles. So very interesting uh, history, personal side of, the, of his history right there. What is the novel's main conflict. This conflict arises exactly at the midpoint of the novel. So you have the exact midpoint and this is where the conflict appears. And people decide that they want to melt the ice of Greenland. And that is the beginning of the conflict when man tries to tame nature, tries to control nature. And nature, of course, rebels or, or rather reacts as she will. We have heard so many stories about, you know, the disastrous results that our desire to control nature and to shape her to our whim have. 
right? For example, you can divert the course of a river and, you know, you cause a drought someplace else. Or you put a dam in a river and you destroy a whole ecosystem somewhere down south. And, and it's always like that, right? So I would say Mountains, Oceans, Giants, like all great novels, is many things, but it is definitely a great environmentalist novel. In many ways, as I, you know, read it, I was reminded of the, the story of Godzilla. This idea that, you know, our actions have disastrous effects on nature that come back to haunt us eventually. And this is a story that, of course, you can check out in many movies, many film versions. But there's also that great song by Blue Oyster Cult, if you want to listen to that. Uh, a word about the language and the worldview conveyed by mountains, oceans, giants. I mentioned uh, prophecy, the mode of prophecy. Also, you could say uh, apocalyptic literature certainly has a, a role to play in here, but there is uh, quite a bit more to the novel. As I was reading Mountains, Oceans, Giants in the term, in terms of the language, right? As I was paying attention to the language, I thought of two figures. One of them was John Muir, and the other one was Saint Francis of Assisi. I would say that, like John Muir. Alfred Dublin is great at describing kinetic nature, so nature in motion, the processes by which the world around us takes shape. That is something that Dublin is wonderful at doing. And then, like St. Francis of Assisi, he is in awe of nature, and he is respectful of her. One of my favorite chapters in the novel is the last chapter of Part 7, which is titled Emergent Life. And in this chapter, Nature gives birth to all sorts of monstrosities as a result of man's abuse. So check out that chapter. It, it is really something very, very uh, awe-inspiring. And here's the connection with apocalyptic uh, writing that I mentioned before. A word about the edition of the novel. And you can see this is a beautiful, it's just a beautiful edition. After so many years of waiting, it's great to have you know, besides the text of the novel, just a great quality printing and, and binding and everything. It's just a, it's just very pleasant. I, I really, really liked it. The translation by uh, Chris Godwin and his introduction also are just an absolute delight. I do not read German in the original, but I can tell you this uh, book, I just devoured it. I read it very quickly, even for me, and I'm a very slow reader, as I've mentioned before in some of my videos. Now, you're going to notice that parts 3 and 4, if you look at the um, index, it says that they are merged and they are abridged, okay? There are omitted passages, and they deal primarily with two characters named Jonathan and Marduk. They have a kind of a sadomasochistic friendship type of bond going on, and these omitted passages have to do with them and their lovers. The omitted passages are very physical. They're just really, really carnal, but ultimately they are about the desire-power dynamic, right? And these passages are a bit overlong, and what happened is that they really threatened to... these characters were almost like becoming protagonists of the novel. Um, it's... you know, they really halt the development of the story, and that is the reason why they were taken out of the book. If you are a completist, like, like me, do not despair. You can go to Chris Godwin's website and download the omitted passages for free. And they amount to a 40, I think it was 43 pages in a PDF document. I read those passages as I read the novel. You know, and I, I have to say I agree with the decision to take them out. Bottom line, Mountains, Oceans, Giants is just one of the best novels that I have ever read. I'll be honest about that and I'll say something else, if I can say this. I actually enjoyed reading this novel more than I did Berlin Alexanderplatz. Even though I loved Berlin Alexanderplatz, you can see my video on it and, and that, you know, you'll be able to tell. But this one I really, really devoured, as I said before. And both novels, Berlin Alexanderplatz and Mountains, Oceans, Giants, just confirmed my feeling that I need to read Dublin a lot more. I, I want to read all his novels now. I, I'm really, really fascinated by his world. And also because he was a tremendous influence on the post-war generation of German writers. This is something that I mentioned in the video on Berlin Alexanderplatz. And I'll add this to, to this video. If, if I can make a very simplistic uh, you know, assessment here of the two novels. 
I see a lot of Berlin Alexanderplatz in the work of Heinrich Böll and a lot of mountains, oceans, giants in the work of Gunther Grass. That's, I know it's very simplistic, but that's the way that I look at it. You have these two uh, currents there, if you will. The novel was published almost 100 years ago, but I would say it is even more relevant today than it was back then. So I really, really recommend that you read this novel. I hope you enjoyed this video, my reflections on Mountains, Oceans, Giants by Alfred Dublin. Do you have any questions, comments, recommendations? As you know, they are always welcome and I would love to hear them. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.